I'm incredibly excited to introduce uh, Rohan to discuss his company, Dapper Labs, the history of NFTs and where he sees his company in the space going in the future. Um, I'll give a brief introduction of Roham and then um, we'll have a conversation for about 40 minutes and then uh, give the audience time to ask questions for the last 20 minutes. Um, Roham is, a, you know, by all accounts and, uh, you know, kind of in every way, a leader in the blockchain and Web3 uh, technology community and um, was really the pioneer of NFTs uh, or at least the kind of first wave of NFTs with CryptoKitties, uh, which was a viral product product that uh, broke out in uh, 2017 and uh, practically broke Ethereum uh, for some time. Um, from those learnings, Roham launched Dapper Labs um, with a mission to drive mainstream adoption and decentralized technologies and, and put a crypto wallet in, in every pocket. Today, Dapper Labs has made Web3 accessible for de developers, creators, and users by designing the Flow ecosystem, a decentralized Web3 platform, which has really distinguished itself by uh, being consumer friendly and has uh, the, the platform has more than 3.6 million accounts. Um, and uh, the games include NBA Top Shop. Chot, which has 1.3 million members and has had over a billion in sales, UFC Strike, NFL All Day, uh, Sousa Balls, and a and, and number of others. The company has raised uh, $650 million and most recently was valued at $7.6 billion. Um, before founding Axiom Zen, Roham served uh, with Rising Tide Fund in Silicon Valley as a partner focused on seed stage investments. And um, he holds a BA and an MS degree in economics and biological sciences from Stanford University. And with that, uh, welcome, Rohan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You know, I thought we would kick things off just uh, uh, giving you a, a chance to give the listeners a sense for the evolution of the business, uh, starting, you know, kind of with Axiom Zen and the launch of CryptoKitties. And what do you learn from that? Yeah, I mean, you 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 give a quick background, but I can um, I can give some of the some of the sort of uh, details in the middle where we started working on. I mean, the first time at Axiom Zen we tried building on blockchain was way back in 2014 and, um, with Bitcoin, uh, but by 2017 we're we're super interested in non currency applications of of the technology and um, kind of just looking at everything we wanted to build. We realized there was a key primitive missing, which is this concept of a non-fungible token, the ability to represent um, something that's individually unique, but part of a broader set. And so that, that was why we started working on the non-fungible token standard in, in early summer 2017, published it by September uh, 20th, 2017. And then um, a couple of months later, launched CryptoKeys. Um, to your point, you know, it, it went viral immediately. It sort of was a financial success. We made, you know, uh, millions of dollars in revenue very quickly, but um, it was also kind of a technological failure in the sense that it became uh, impossible to play um, very quickly out the gate, um, both in terms of cost as well as kind of reliability and, and, and other things on the, on the Ethereum network. Um, but, but it kickstarted the start of Dapper Labs. And since then, we, we sort of dedicated our, ourselves to saying, you know, this technology can really help the, the mainstream. There's a big gap in terms of user experience, safety, you know, the, the kinds of applications that, that add value to everyday uh, people's lives rather than just being about speculation games and things like that. Um, and so we started the journey, Race Capital, um, from some of the world's best uh, folks, including uh, your, your colleagues at Google Ventures and, um, and have been sort of plugging away, um, plugging away ever since. Um, it's actually, I just looked it up, we're over 10 million accounts on Flow. Um, so it's been a wow. cool, um, cool few few months where where there's and and we as dapper labs we're two out of the five top five apps um but we're actually not the top two um or top shop might might be back at number two now but um there, there are other companies that are building products that are um that are sort of coming strong out the gate and um and building a strong foundation which which i get super excited about awesome how long did it take to come out with flow flow so when we started the company um so if you think about CryptoKitties, November 28th, 
Uh, we were working in the Ethereum ecosystem for a year and a half or more um, past that. And we tried building, so we built the first smart contract wallet that was for consumers, first wallet to do pay for gas on users' behalf, first wallet to do key recovery, um, first wallet to, to integrate credit card um, uh, payments into the flow. Um, and, and we didn't give up on Ethereum until May 2019 um, when we had signed the deal with MBA and we were just, we couldn't credibly look at ourselves in the mirror and say, we're going to bet the company's future on, on a technology we don't, we don't, um, uh, we don't think is going to get. We spent a lot of time with Vitalik and, and um, a lot of the developers behind other layer ones. And, and along the way, we were sort of designing our perfect system as app developers. What would be the platform that we would want to build on? Um, and, and we were validating that with you know, folks at Andreessen, Dan Bonet at Stanford, who later became um, a partner at Andreessen. He's, he's an advisor to the company. Um, Tahir El Gamal um, at, at Salesforce, you know, key inventor of SSL. He, he's an advisor to the company. So they helped validate that, hey, the approach we've taken and the things we want as developers make sense. And the approach we've taken is, is um, sound. And so May 2019 is when we started building uh, Flow in earnest, um, launched at early alpha, May 2020 um, with NBA Top Shot um, in, in early alpha and then came out of, came into sort of public beta October um, 2020. So uh, it's taken a while. And, and even, you know, today, um, thir- it, it, in about uh, 15 days, Flow will become completely permissionless where any developer will be able to publish any uh, piece of code to the network. Um, and so sort of that's taken, you know, a year and a half, two years of hardening and scaling and, um, and, and security work as well. So it's been a, it's been a quite a quite an involved process, but um, but the whole way we felt really good because we're dog fooding our own product and flow. You know, NBA Top Shot alone has more transactions than most other NFT projects combined. So when you first pitched the NBA, it was you didn't talk so much about which ecosystem you were going to build on. No, it wasn't immediately uh, clear. When, you know, we our our goal as a company was mainstream adoption. It wasn't creating another layer one um, platform, and we, we wanted to be sure that it's something that that was that necessitated it. Um, it was contemplated within the agreement, um, but but the default assumption was that you know someone else would figure something out, um, and, and that never never ended up happening. What um, when did you first start talking to the NBA? Uh, March of two thousand eighteen. April 2018. So, so, over a year. And it's, how long did it take to get to uh, an agreement with them? A little over a year. Okay, so they were pretty forward thinking, though, huh? because I guess they were really after CryptoKitties. There really weren't any um, significant projects, um, you know, while while your discussions were going on. Yeah, Crypto Winter set in pretty quick after CryptoKitties uh, launched, and. You know, we were one of the few, you know, it was us, OpenSea, you know, Axie, the Axie, Sky Mavis, which is the Axie Infinity guys, um, and, you know, folks like Alchemy. And it was a very small subset of companies that were sort of born in that flurry of activity and then sort of survived through, through the rest of the period. Um, and not only was the MBA forward thinking in the sense of working with us, but they were or, or sort of being open to working with us, but they were, had a full team staff that whole year trying to really understand, hey, what's the regulatory framework that these assets are going to fall in? You know, we're take, all our lawyers are telling us, no, let's deeply understand why and what position we're going to take and because no one else has, right? There was no other um, sort of high, other than, you know, CryptoKitties was sort of the best example and that was from a startup. Um, and so there was no other big brand that had taken that step. And so we, we spent a lot of time with them. I mean, our, our, uh, but we did that even before CryptoKitties where we were the first company to go to the securities regulators in Canada um, and sit down with them, explain to them what you know blockchain was, what smart contracts were, what NFTs, this new thing called NFTs were, and and they uh, wrote their first no action letter in crypto about NFTs and said, hey, this is not a security. Um, so we had sort of some experience kind of explaining this stuff to to folks, but um, I think it was a necessary process, and and I think getting the MBA was a necessary catalyst for um, just adoption of the whole space in general because it made it safe for a lot of other content owners and creators to to participate in and um and made them realize hey this is this technology actually helps us protect our rights um and and create alignment with our customers um rather than um something that we should be scared of awesome and so who 
thinks through the you know kind of tokenomics aspect of the game like how much how much how many to launch you know kind of every shot you know kind of all of those types of nuances um i mean right now there's a full there's sort of two layers is an economy team and and a game design team um originally it was just you know one person that was sort of doing everything in in, in their heads and the crypto kitties it was Dieter, my, my cto um and so it kind of evolved from there but but to, each ip you know we have nba we have nfl ufc has um, uh, an economist as well as a game designer um, the role of you know in a, in a traditional game the game designer owns the economy but in a sort of open economy game we we want someone to also um, sort of be ob- observing the macro movements and correlations between other other um, economies um, so so it's it's split it's split that way um, and uh, and they use both data as well as kind of instinct and um, and now they have new tools at their disposal so we have both the ability to create new content as well as pull content out of the ecosystem. Um, and so they kind of uh, make those choices based on the uh, customer experience they want to they wanna create. We, our customers all do it differently. And I should mention, you know, NFTs are, um, you can use them in a sort of game environment similar that's more live operated like NBA Top Shot, or they can be, you know, an artist coming in from the street, taking a picture with an iPhone, minting a thousand things just because they feel like it. Um, pricing at a dollar just because they feel like it or putting an auction on it, whatever it may be. So it'll look a lot more like social media where it will be chaotic to an extent. Some posts will go viral, some won't. Some things will be successful, some won't. There'll be a long tail of creators that no one cares about and and uh, and sort of creators that go viral quickly but then die out. You know, it'll be more dynamic and I think our ecosystem is designed to handle both sides of it. But NBA Top Shot is a little more live operated like a game where there's an economist, a game designer to sort of look at the data, they make choices that are long-term uh, oriented and um, but it doesn't all have to be that way just like you know lots of social media accounts are very well thought out lots of them are very organic and and um, uh, uh, sort of impromptu awesome so give me a sense for uh, the distribution of the effort across your company between some of these first party games the and the ecosystem development and um, and maybe, uh, you know, kind of other things that you're doing? Yeah, we're about a third uh, sports studio. We're about a 40% studio, 60% platform. So the third sports studio is almost all, almost everything that we do in, in the first party development is in the sports arena. We do some experimentation with CryptoKitties and, um, and others, but even that is designed to say, how can we be a, create a seed that then others can build on? Because that's in large part what we think is special about um, Web3 is even... Even an asset can be a platform, um, uh, much less sort of an application. Every application is a platform, but every asset can also be a platform. So that's sort of the, the lens we take. We spend a, a most of our first party efforts on on sports because we think we've there's a thousand X opportunity right there. We've served a million NBA fans. Um, there's a billion NBA fans. Um, and so there's there's sort of immense uh, opportunity there. Um, you know, on the platform side, our efforts are split between the core flow open source development um, and then the sort of dapper layer on top of that, which is, you know, payments, user experience, keep the assets safe, um, help the user discover their ne- next product. It's, it's sort of a, uh, it's, the, it's the wallet layer. Um, and our efforts there is probably also 60-40 with 60 on the um, wallet layer, 40 on the core, core blockchain. And, and the core blockchain's effort has been going down over, uh, over time as it becomes much more decentralized. Um, as others start contributing to the code base and, and taking over parts of parts of it, um, there's a Flow Foundation now that is taking over um, parts of actually, uh, you know, ca- keeping the network running and making e- economic decisions and things like that. So um, it's it's really nice. So the biggest chunk of our efforts, is our own um, first party effort, content that's driving users and really demonstrating the power of the platform, which is not just the blockchain, but it's also that user experience. Uh, layer on top of it. Awesome. Um, maybe give us a sense for what are the were the primary design principles of Flow. What you were trying to enable uh, creators to do, and you know, kind of how you see it evolving. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can get into some of the specifics, but but I'll relay one conversation I had with with Vitalik um, about. Um, about sort of uh, uh, features that we wanted. Um, I mean, we didn't even, there's certain things about Ethereum that can't be changed, but there were, there were things that, um, 
there were things that could be changed. And there was this, there's a, the f- design philosophy of most um, protocol builders has always been, hey, this protocol should be as simple as possible. And, and that's, there's a lot of value in that principle. Uh, but our approach was the protocol should make it easy for developers to build apps that people can actually use. Whereas there's certain things about protocol design that make it impossible to, um, to, to create the kind of user experience we think normal people need no matter what you, what, how, however education you give and how to tutorials and how important it is to secure your own keys and, 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 and all that stuff. So, so flow is really about, um, I mean, maybe to, to sort of simplify, you can think flow is about reducing cost and that's cost per transaction. We're one of the uh, cheapest of any scalable blockchain, but also the carbon um, and environmental friendliness of the network as a whole. They're kind of related because basically the cost you pay is, uh, for the the com- networks and the and computers in the network to perform the tasks, and so because of how efficient the flow architecture is, um, those are minimized while still being decentralized. Um, so that's one aspect of it, um, and it's relatively straightforward because if you can transact and pay a, you know fifty cents in fees, uh, if you have to pay fifty cents or five dollars in fees, you're never going to do truly scalable, um, hey, free assets for everyone or or Things that are you know accessible to the to the everyday user who doesn't spend money every day in digital uh, in, in in every digital experience. Um, so that, that's one thing. Cost and I think environmental friendliness is very important to newer generations as well. Um, the the second maybe richest kind of bucket of of um, design differences or philosophical differences has been around safety, where um, you know because of the flow program language, because of the client wallet interface, because of simple decisions we made like you know the the public you can keep the same public address on a flow wallet but cycle the private keys um in it so that um so that you can um so you don't have this hey my private key leaked i have to get rid of basically my wallet is um forever useless i have to cycle all the assets out Uh, simple things like that um that create a, a seamlessness on the on the application layer and the ability for the app not to feel like a um, complicated thing that you have the user has to assemble together. So, so there's a lot of that goes into safety. The founder of QuantSnap um, said his the, their team did the deepest evaluation of our code and and said it was by far the most block the secure blockchain they've ever uh, the secure code they've ever reviewed just because of um, the the perspective we've taken in terms of um, um, you know safety being so important in uh, mainstream adoption and and then you know every day you hear it about a board ape. A hack and a uh, you know you know Discord compromise leading to users losing their assets, etc. Every day you hear about people losing their private keys and this sort of thing. Um, so safety was very very important to us, and we can kind of get into a lot of the a lot of the details there. And then the third thing is we wanted you know there's a lot of decisions in protocol design that have been um, ho- you know that have been sort of carried over from Bitcoin to Ethereum and then from Ethereum to other chains, and um, and we want it to be future proof. So things like you know, the encryption curve that Flow uses is compatible with the secure enclave on iPhone um, and Android key store. Now, we don't have a mobile wallet that uses it yet. And so it's not sort of hasn't broken through the mainstream yet. But it's um, it's it's we wanted to make sure that 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 it has that future proof um, capability. Flow wallets are all smart contract wallets. They're fully programmable. Flow can be fully cross chain. And so today, a company called Layer Zero is working on an integration where you can use Flow wallets to hold assets from any blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, fungible, non-fungible, does, doesn't matter. So like we, the, the way it was written is it has an application platform, not a token, um, not a token um, uh, machine. And so, so we think it's also extremely future proof. So cost, safety, um, and sort of this, the concept of we built it to be a mainstream consumer platform. And so things that um, haven't even been used yet, like true mobile native um, uh, compatibility, um, flow flow has already sort of thought of and so when you go and pitch ip holders that have you know some of the, you know kind of mainstream assets like a disney or or kind of uh you know fifa or whoever are kind of the next partners um what who are the competitors um at that level they don't have the capability to build the products themselves and so they're getting pitched by I mean, some layer ones that are have spun up studio teams to build uh, apps, or they're getting pitched by app companies who've raised venture capital 
and said, hey, we can, we can build these products. But very few companies have anything in market that, that resembles anything that any of those brands would want to be associated with. Um, and in terms of, like I mentioned, with NBA Top Shot has um, uh, on the order of you know, millions of transactions um, in the last you know, couple of months. Whereas if you look at something like a board ape, you know, very, very successful economy, a thousand single digit thousands of transactions, so just very different kind of um, a scale of uh, familiarity with, with scale. Um, so, so the competition doesn't necessarily look when we talk to bigger brands, it's all about safety and all about, you know, the consumer experience. Um, part of that comes from Dapper, which is 97% um, USD rather than crypto. It's, it's, you know, you can buy a dollar of an asset for a dollar, pay five cents in fees. You know, it's, it's sort of very streamlined and, and uh, you can imagine a user posting a link on Twitter and Instagram and people clicking through that link, buying that NFT without needing to know that it's an NFT. So a lot of it is that user experience layer that, um, that, is, a, that is a game changer and, and is enabled because of flow, but it isn't flow directly. Um, and then, you know, environmental friendliness, absolutely key because their their super fans get up in arms if um, they think that the brand is doing something that is that is anti um, anti environment and, and that's something that you know whether you're Disney or EA or whoever you can't afford um, um, and then it's and then it is things like hey it's future proof hey it's you know um, uh, you, you don't hear about NBA Top Shot accounts being hacked you hear about um, Ethereum ha- accounts being hacked all the time um, so it's 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 around kind of consumer consumer experience. And what's the pitch to crypto and uh, for to game companies or designers working on products for crypto native users? Crypto native. So if by crypto native, you mean, you know, the average. Like the next Axie type thing. So we don't, we historically have not had a strong pitch for, um, you know, fully kind of crypto native folks, primarily because, because we're not, flow is so different than Ethereum. It's not EVM compatible, Ethereum virtual machine compatible. You need a, um, a centralized exchange to turn ETH into Flow, and so you need to do KYC. And so you don't have this like pile of you know non KYC money that needs places to sort of play. Um, and so so that that's that's that drives a lot of payment volume in sort of non custodial ecosystems um, because it's it's dollars that couldn't find a home inside that don't want to go inside you know bank accounts or you know, anything else they want stuff to do that is fully kind of, you know, in, in outside the, the walls, so to speak. Um, so that par- partially is getting, I mean, that partially goes away once there are these, you know, layer zero type trustless uh, bridges and exchanges. Um, so it could theoretically be, it will, it'll be inevitable that people will start all kinds of play to earn stuff um, once the permissionlessness is open. But a lot of the things currently on flow are, are very kind of straightforward, products that that you know a user doesn't necessarily have to even know that it's cryptocurrency under the hood they just know that this digital asset is tradable this marketplace is transparent every transaction i can go look it up from five years ago 10 years from now um the the third party developers seem to like writing software for this product and you know today i have these two apps tomorrow i have another app you know uh and and yeah just kind of keeps the ecosystem keeps running like that's what the customer feels they don't necessarily feel, oh, this is crypto or blockchain or, or, or whatever. That's sort of the, the ecosystem we've kind of attracted. Um, and I think that that's, that's good. Now, what's the pitch going to be for the crypto native developer tomorrow? It's going to be, well, we have the most users. We have 10 million accounts, most of which are um, you know, real people. There isn't you know, these speculative games to play. There aren't big decentralized exchanges on flow that are giving out you know, uh, 20% you know, annual yield or monthly yield or whatever. We don't have any of that stuff. Every person that has an account on Flow has it because they're built using your product on Flow that they're paying for, um, and and the and not in, in, because of the hey Flow is different. Flow is you know a lot of the assets U.S. dollars et cetera. There hasn't been this hey bought asset for a dollar it turned into hundred dollars in a day or or you know what happens on Ethereum bought it for two thousand sold it for two hundred thousand. That hasn't been the thing that it's attracted these customers. Um, and so, I, and I think that's a good thing, especially in this environment where I think customer mentality is changing. It's not, it's no longer hey, I have a pile of money I want to show off or I'm just going to burn this cash and, oh, it turned into something new and, you know, whatever. It's more about, hey, I'm a fan. How do I get more money, how, value for my money? Because I've got 20 bucks to spend on this ticket. And like, if I'm an NBA Top Shot collector, I actually get more for my money than if I'm not. 
um, or, or, you know, if I'm a UFC champions NFT holder, I get access into champions club. Um, I can go with my family and go with my friends and, and get them a, uh, access to the open bar. Like that's the, that's the mentality that I think people will be attracted to in, um, in this new, um, in this new world where, you know, everything's changed and people, I mean, you know, for some people they haven't realized it yet, but six months from now, 12 months from now, if the economy continues to get worse, people's mentality will be about, you know, just like it was 2008, right? When you had Airbnb and Uber and all these, pa the passion economy was born out of a recession. This can be passion economy 2.0. Um, th by this, I mean sort of web three in general, but you know, in our products in particular as well. So that, that's kind of the mindset we're in is things have changed, but it's an opportunity um, uh, more than anything. Awesome. Um, and how do you think about the, um, the competition with other blockchains. Like one of the things that we've observed is just the amount of money that blockchains are kind of handing out to developers. I know you've started, you know, you have uh, been a participant, I guess, in the, the blockchain, in the flow fund, $750 million flow fund. And how do you see uh, that, you know, kind of shaping behavior? So, 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 so to be, to be clear, some, some numbers. So we've invested in about a hundred companies as Dapper Labs, but very small amounts, usually any from 25 to a hundred thousand dollars, some, you know, million more, but, but very small amounts. Those companies have gone on to raise over $3 billion from, uh, from other venture capitalists, you know, Andreessen, Cotu, Tiger, Sequoia, all, all of these folks. And the $750 million fund isn't our dollars. It's actually primarily from, Folks like Andreessen and Kotu and um, and USV, uh, Venrock, Coin Fund, whatever it might be, and so we've we've as the we've sort of seen all these folks splashing this money around, and we've seen well we have we've got cash in the bank. We could be splashing money. We could be selling tokens. But a, I'd rather keep the tokens for long term and use the cash to build products that create more cash, um, and then get the VCs to sort of invest in the the you know the next generation of products on top of our platforms. But we're going to get a transaction fee. We're going to get the um, the, the sort of, you know, token appreciation value, et cetera. Um, and that's the perspective we've taken is let professionals, uh, allocate capital to the best companies rather than have companies just come to us because we're, we're handing out, um, we're handing out cash and incentives. Um, and so that, that's, that's largely been the perspective we've taken with the capital and, and the ecosystem is pretty well funded, you know, three and a half billion dollars or so mostly raised pretty recently. Um, and that 750 is over a billion now. Um, even now, we're seeing VCs interested, at least in the early stage, for sure, because you know this is the only area in tech where there's a thousand x expansion opportunity in the in the TAM, right? Like the TAM or project management software isn't going to get a thousand x bigger in the next year or two. Um, but but the number of people that have actually interacted with Web three applications is tiny, and so there's um, there's and the number of NFT creators. Andreessen was so proud to published this report that said you know the dollar uh gain per nft creator and they sort of you know total dollars you know nft economy divided by twenty two thousand creators that's bonkers Twenty two thousand is you can't even you know you can't fill a big stadium with twenty two thousand people and so that's sort of that's how early all of this stuff is and how difficult um it you know the number of steps it takes to mint an nft and then the number of steps it takes for your um community to buy that nft this is super early stage we just got to focus on how do we expand that thing by thousand X and, um, and everything else follows because, um, you know, there's monetization is kind of built into the rails here, which is also a little different than previous platform shifts. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, um, the recent trends in crypto, very recent trends. And, um, you know, one of the things that I found interesting was, you know, all the, uh, board apes, um, you know, kind of celebrity purchases and then those quietly being removed from their profiles. Like it just reflects the broader, I guess, concerns. And I would love to get your perspective on that. Um, look, I mean, I, I mean you, you've seen previous technology shifts, right? Like there's, it takes time for even something like open source software for decade plus people are saying well is it a real thing you know should you base your business on it etc software as a service right is it a real thing could it would real businesses move towards or whatever that's that's like normal that's that's normal cycles with crypto the problem is you've got this 
supercharged nature of it, which is um, which is with the token. Everything has a has a market. Everything has a price. And so on the way up, there's this supercharged thing of everyone feeling like they're right. Um, and on the way down, obviously everyone, you know, humans kind of get panicked and and all this stuff. And so that that um, uh, Jesse Walden, um, who, who who was in Dresden at the time, called it tumorous growth. And I really it creates growth that is sort of like spike, crash, spike, crash, spike, crash. And you see it in Bitcoin over the last, you know, um, a decade plus. And then you also see it in, in, in every crypto project still, because people aren't, two reasons. I mean, developers and, and creators aren't good enough at sort of managing it yet. Um, I think we're, we're getting better. Um, and then second, I think consumers, um, future generations get more and more comfortable with volatility. Um, I almost think of it as, Generation, you know, the way that people were very uncomfortable with privacy in social media, but but eventually now people are, you know, posting pictures of their kids uh, everywhere. People will get more comfortable with sort of the price volatility. They'll sort of understand some of the dynamics better, and that'll mean less craziness on the way up because everyone's not fomoing, and less craziness on the way down because everyone's not panicking. Um, people just realize that hey, you know, s- s- things things cycle and and. You know, they, they sort of have markets built into them from day one because everything has a has a market. That's how I think you know behavior will um, will evolve. But you know, I think there's mostly nothing's changed for me, um, and I think for our team, it's hey, under, empathize with the customer um, and that their mentality has shifted. Their Netflix is down seventy five percent. You know, same as Bitcoin. Like it's not. It's, there's no asset class that's been safe from from any of this stuff. And so and so just build build for value now. There was a lot of noise out there, right? Like things that, and I won't count Board Ape in that as, as noise, and we can debate the 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 sort of the power in that brand and and, and that community. Um, but there's been a lot of noise where, you know, obviously that random picture of a you know of an animal isn't going to be worth a hundred thousand dollars. And when people realize that game, game of musical chairs unwinding, um, it can you know skeptics can feel very smart, sort of pointing at it and saying, well, hey, look, this technology wasn't ever going to work. But that's what it, it was always a game of musical chairs. So like it's fun until the music stops. And but nobody, you, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the technology totally. can be used for a lot of other things. Um, and so I think that 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 just, you know, it's a natural cycle of, of things. I just encourage my team to sort of keep their head down. Um, again, empathize that, hey, the customer mindset has changed, but that this is a huge opportunity for our products. Yeah. And um, what... What do you think the Googles, Amazons, Microsofts of the world uh, can do to help uh, legitimize this space? Or are we, you know, kind of even relevant? Um, I think there's there's a fair amount that's that's super relevant. I mean, number one, you know, you know, we have a great partnership with Google Cloud, and sort of that idea of powering the infrastructure is is I think important. Um, and and whether that infrastructure is payments or um, or hardware, because you know, our apps will need to run on your phones. Um, there's, there's a lot to, to sort of do there, right? Like both running the core blockchain network as well as recognizing that, hey, consumers are still going to need, you know, hardware devices to interact with these, these applications. Um, and, so, and so, you know, how can the hardware be better suited for, um, for, for the new platform is I think maybe one layer of it. Um, the next layer, you know, I, 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 would, I don't know if there are sort of open source efforts at Google, but kind of just kind of contributing to these these platforms and technologies seems like the best way to 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 try and get um, you know exposure to it. Whether and then and then the, the the thing I get most excited about is creator platforms where you know whether it's YouTube or or others you know this technology is about kind of giving empowering creators to connect with their communities or at least the NFT component of it can be can be uh, used there. And so um, and so how can how can Google or, or YouTube be a leader there rather than a um, you know, uh, because at the end of the day, you guys are a technology company, and this is just another, um, this is just another technology. In some ways, you know, much easier than mobile to kind of adapt to because it's it's just about software. Um, but in some ways, harder because it's almost like social media. And of course, you know, the the there's a little bit of history there with with Google. Like, how, how do you kind of you know change the thinking on what a what a custom what peer to peer um, interaction can can look like, um, but I think just starting with hey the the hardware component is is something that um, no crypto native company will 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 sort of start with, um, and um, um, and then 
you know, getting into the open source and, and seeing ways to actually collaborate with these decentralized communities. Um, you know, so even Google can play an even bigger part in something like Flow that started as a Dapper Labs project, but that could potentially, that is now something that Fortune 500 and startups are uh, building on top of, including some of your, your other bigger clients. So, um, so I think it can be a, a very fruitful ground. Yeah, it seems like um, users, like we're talking about a tiny number of users right now, let's say, you know, kind of your numbers of 10 million is actually what I thought the size of the whole market was in terms of people that have interacted with NFTs. So maybe it's, you know, kind of the market size is 15 million right now or something in that zone. And I know that um, Andreessen and Andreessen's forecast, they were kind of trying to put some numbers to it and estimate the future, um, you know, see a billion users in 2031. So still quite a long time until we get to, uh, that was there, you think sooner? Way sooner. Okay, um, that's I, interesting. I, way sooner, because you have the only problems are software and user experience. And the opportunity is is so driven by um, there's there's like value built in, right? If you think about the once we figure out that how to make that growth non tumorous, it's it, it can be and the phones are already there, right? How many Android phones already exist in people's pockets? Um, yeah. So your argument is they took kind of the web growth and extrapolated from that, but now we're building on successive waves of technology that make it easier to drive adoption. That's how it always happens, right? Like yeah. speed of social media adoption, speed of Everything so much just kind of gets crunched, um, and if and I think social media is probably the closest analogy because it's also pure software and, and consumer behavior. So you feel like we're one, you know, kind of successful game away from hundreds of millions of people interacting with these things. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a hundred million person game would be aggressive, but you know what happened with crypto keys was about a hundred k and be a top shot about a million. I think. What, what we think about is, hey, how can NBA Top Show go to 10? How can NFL All Day go to 10? Um, and then, boom, how can you go to 20? And, and for us, it's a lot about you know, integration, where the fan is, whether it's real world, whether it's broadcast, streaming, um, uh, et cetera, as well as I mean, we do think about gaming and gamification. But if you think about mobile apps, there's still sort of 10, 20 million MA, M MAU. I mean, there's, there's bigger ones, but sort of the NBA, um, uh, some of the NBA. So, so we think that this, this can go way beyond um, – gaming in terms of number of users because it can be a lighter weight um, adoption. It becomes part of their user's online profile. Like we think of the NBA Top Shot collection as a user's profile page, more their Instagram homepage than their, um, you know, Amazon order history or, or however you want to kind of think about it. Um, or, or your Fortnite like asset list. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's a little bit more who I am than what I have um, in, in, in a lot of ways. Awesome. I'm going to turn uh, to some audience questions. Um, so please send those in. Um, the first one is, what is the role of UX in Web3? Um, I think the role of UX in Web3, I mean, the easy thing to say is to abstract everything out. But of course, that's not sufficient because then you don't get maybe get the full value of it, et cetera. And so early custodial marketplace centralized marketplace is where we would like that so i think i think of the value of web3 is uh, sorry the role of user experience is keep the user safe while getting them the the benefits of the technology um and and that keep the user safe is you know one ex getting them to pay in the payment method that they have without having to jump through hoops that create kind of lots of opportunities for failure right like sign up for a crypto account buy the crypto or oh, bought it at the wrong price or you transfer it to the wrong wallet or just infinite sort of service area for for problems and then once you have the asset keep it safe um, and for different users that's going to mean different things we we like you know the model that that you know of, of saying the user needs to choose hey you get a custodial account when you sign up but then you can add you know you go you can go to your settings add a multi-factor authentication add you know your own password uh take take full custody and put it on your mobile phone that's perfectly fine um that sort of full flow is is nowhere close to i mean even in our products it's 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 nowhere close to being fully there um and and sort of in the future i think it's all about discovery and distribution where you know how do you even find what else i can do with my nft or what um what other places i can take it into how can i find you know what other communities I want to be a part of, what, what other assets are dropping, what things are being 
what opportunities are there for me, maybe financially. Um, no one's kind of, there's no real distribution layer where the discovery layer is Twitter still of, um, of how people find out what, what to do. So I think there's a lot of user experience kind of from a, how do I just use this thing to how do I keep it safe to how do I kind of find the next thing and, and, um, uh, and connect with my friends and, and all that, all that fun stuff. Yeah. So the vision you have is really one where the technology is abstracted away. Um, as opposed the, to people learning necessarily how this all works. The vision I have is one where people get the value up front and they can peel back the layers and sort of look under the hood and it's all there, right? It's not, nothing is faked, um, but, but it's a, it's a upfront, you just get the value because I think majority and a majority of, by the way, the, I, I should mention the 10 million user number is user accounts. And so accounts can be created by different applications. The same thing on Ethereum. A little less so on Flow because there's less wallets and and you know less people doing programmatic things. Like a user doesn't have you know hundred thousand wallets like like they might might if they have a sort of bot that controls many many accounts like they might on Ethereum. So so the ten million number isn't ten million unique uh, individuals. There's almost certainly some duplication there, uh, but it is millions of individuals, single digit millions across the entire ecosystem would be. So ten million across the entire ecosystem would be a high estimate in my opinion. Uh, okay. Of, of genuine people that, that have maybe even to tried it once, but at least have, have tried it. Um, so um, I wanted to kind of touch on that. Yeah. And okay. Thanks for clarifying that. The, you know, it's, it, it's, it's actually hard to gauge these numbers. So this is really useful The you know, we had that experience in our family of, um, you know, kind of the onboarding challenge. Uh, we were all trying to play Axie over Thanksgiving last year. And, you know, my wife sent like some Ethereum to a Ronan wallet. Boom, she lost a thousand dollars. My son was so angry with her. You know, it is, it is, it does feel like dial up days of the internet where you kind of had to like, oh, you have to do this and then plug this in here and, you know, kind of figure it all out. And so that's why I was somewhat enticed by your, um, vision of abstracting it away since that just seems a lot easier but i i wonder who will do that will it be the you know kind of the game or application developers or will it be the coin bases of the world that just onboard people for all of web3 how do you imagine that playing out um well i think it's going to be us um because each individual game might onboard lots of users but then they're going to need somewhere to Okay, what's the next thing? Where do I put my stuff? How do I keep my stuff safe? All that stuff. And, and the coin bases of the world are very centered around, um, I mean, they started as financial companies first and foremost. Um, and, you know, fundamentally all of their, I mean, a lot of their NFT efforts have been kind of start, stop and, um, and not, not successful. Um, but the biggest thing is they're, you know, I think they're not, they're not smart contract first uh developers and at the end of the day the future like this whole every single wallet that we create is a programmable composable um lego piece among among everything else and so yes create the user experience create the full flow but then have it be open at the bottom so developers can then um build that open ecosystem so it's not minitel to, to our conversation before before this it doesn't end up being just the user experience that gives the user the answer to once but it also lets new stuff enter at at the at the bottom um, and be fully composable, fully open, fully fully decentralized. Um, and I think that innovation is not done at the protocol level either, where there's there's things that are left in terms of making flow fully mobile native, um, showing the world how that even works, making a real cross chain ecosystem. So that you know the vision I have is developers will choose blockchains on base of hey I'm going to do my computation on flow. I'm going to take payment from Ethereum and Bitcoin and flow and Solana and whatever else. I might do my decentralized exchange work on, on this other side chain. I might use Compound for which is going to have its own chain for you know lending and borrowing to like balance my books or whatever it might be. Just like today, a developer says I'm going to use Google Cloud for this, and I'm going to use Redis for that. And I'm going to use whatever it might be. Everything has its own um, uh, sort of what it's what it's good for. Now we think that we've built the sort of application computation uh, layer, and and then what what the user will the the user interface layer into kind of what all of these other assets and, and chains and stuff will, will be. Uh, but it will be the developer that chooses, hey, how do I um, assemble this stuff together? And the consumer says, ooh, 
pretty picture. I want that. Or, or, Hey, I want to, you know, engage with my friend in this way, or, Hey, I'm, I'm invited to a challenge or, or whatever, whatever it might be. It's not going to be anything about the technology or, or like, I mean, uh, just the last, last thing I'll say is that the customer doesn't think, I mean, you, you guys know this better than anyone. They don't think to themselves, which search engine am I going to use? Oh, Google. Cool, cool, cool. And they don't switch unless it's bad or, or sort of, Oh, which ride sharing app. And I'm going to have a network of, I'm going to compare ride sharing apps. Just, just use the, the, the product becomes the, the category in a way. The customer doesn't sit there choosing what wallet they want to use on what chain to buy what asset. It's sort of, it just needs to be much more, much more seamless. And I think, um, uh, and I think it's going to take someone that's going to dog food the, their own product as well. So I think it's going to be, um, it's going to be us and it's going to be pretty, pretty soon. Now, how quickly that goes to a billion users um, will I think be where, you know, maybe my estimates are more aggressive than, than most. Yeah, they are. Um, what is the, um, uh, you know, one of the nice things about building everything on flow is you have a little bit more, you know, control over the security of the ecosystem. And when you start talking about bridges or, you know, kind of unifying chains, you kind of lose some of that. When do you feel like that will kind of be minimized so that people can be comfortable moving things across chains. Um, so it's already, it, so Dapper Labs has stepped back from that stuff um, quite a while ago, maybe six or nine months ago. Um, it says that there are, um, there've been multiple auditors that have been pushing, um, they've been doing light security review, but they've been pushing other people's apps live. And, um, and there's now been a process of th th uh, three, four months of hardening and um, and, and testing and audits and, uh, and and things like that to kind of to make sure it's it's now ready to be completely open again. I think uh, the next fifteen days or so is, is what I believe it's it, it's slated to be. Um, and the and it's in testing now. Um, and the the reason for that is um, I don't know how much this group has looked into programming languages on blockchains, uh, but there's this concept of resource oriented programming where um, uh, the the programming language itself sort of respects rules around digital assets and, and ownership and, and also governance. So, so the, the programming language itself is sort of mapped to, um, it says, hey, if I own this asset, um, it won't let a, a, a command from you to move it even sort of compile because it, it sort of recognizes, hey, I own this asset. Whereas in every other programming language, an ownership is very much a, just a, a sort of hack together thing because the digital things aren't unique, right? They're, they're just everything's a data structure and so so that's that's the primary thing that makes flow it and and libra was the we we started working on this research oriented concept in parallel with the libra team they published the libra white paper first and so we they called it resources and we sort of um adapted our work to them we've been and we and it worked with that team to make sure our program language is compatible with um the one they came up with i mean now obviously it's not going to ship in in that shape but but that concept of resource oriented programming makes it much safer for because your uh, uh, unsafe smart contract can't um, uh, access my assets unless it compromises my wallet as well. Um, and, and Flow has things like uh, human readable security where the wallet will be able to tell the user what they're signing on, on MetaMask or in general on Ethereum. It's not possible. The wallet doesn't know. It's just this gibberish sort of string of whatever it is. And um, and, and even to the extent that you might have an NFT. And the other thing is you can't just airdrop NFTs into Flow wallets. A user has to uh, accept that airdrop. Um, whereas today on Ethereum, you have exploits where I can airdrop an NFT that looks exactly like your NFT. You'll go look at it and open. So you'll say, oh, I have two of these things. I'm going to list one of them for sale. Just by listing it for sale, that can compromise your account because that can give the, the if it's a malicious smart contract, can give full access to your wallet contents. Um, and that's just bonkers. <laughs> There's no way that 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 by itself is going to be able to to succeed because um, you know anything that's that unsafe doesn't go true mainstream. And the other example is you know smartphones before um, the the app store where you know it was unsafe to install anything. You know you had to make sure hey the version number is compatible with the patch that you had on your operating system. Otherwise you're going to get a blue screen of death on your Windows CE whatever it was. Um, and that just made it so that only pro users installed stuff. And, and so develop, there was less developers developing because there was less users installing it. And that concept of safety is just really important for mainstream adoption. And do you think that's going to be easier to do in a kind of more um, controlled environment 
like flow versus something like Solana where you maybe have more, uh, I don't know, independent developer momentum? Um, well, again, I, I think that um, the control is not an area where flow is going to, like flow is already open and decentralized and it's going to be completely permissionless very shortly. Um, and so it's a little bit more of the, the actual core design of it that's, that keeps the safety rather than, hey, there's just less stuff on it. I think the less stuff on it, my fear is that it's a little bit intranet versus internet or AOL versus open web or, or, um, uh, or Minitel versus internet. Um, and, and the, and, but what we do is we have that wallet layer on top. And we say, hey, look, anything within the wallet layer, we keep you safe. It's almost like guaranteed, essentially. You can't have your stuff out. You can't have your stuff stolen. You, we, we keep all your, all your all, every application that you use is reviewed. No one's going to hack your stuff. Outside of that wallet ecosystem, it's almost, in, in my mind, it's almost like incognito mode on a browser where it's a little bit less safe. It's a, I mean, that's not what incognito mode is. But in a sense, we create a little sandbox that says, hey, in this sandbox, you're, you're, you're in the Wild West or um, there's, there's sort of things that happen that, again, because of flow, it can't compromise your whole, your whole thing, but it can... Um, there's there's all kinds of stuff that, that hasn't even been thought of yet. So um, so that's a little bit of you know flow is an open system, but you, it's it's built in a way where applications can preserve customer experience and and, and Dapper is the best way we um, uh, preserve customer experience for for most newbies. Hmm. Now the um, if you look at it, there's been you know kind of let's say 150 million or so people who have who own Bitcoin in the world. Um, some number of people who own Ethereum that's kind of significantly less and then kind of 10 million people transacting. We're at the, you know, kind of probably an inflection point for regulation. What do you, and I guess you were early in terms of soliciting those views. What's your uh, kind of prediction in terms of what happens in the next year? Um. I mean, I'm, I'm wary making predictions on areas I'm not an expert in. I'm definitely not an expert in, in regulators. Um, I, as Dapper Labs, our head of regulatory affairs is ex-SCC, ex-CFTC. Um, our head of government affairs is, is um, Alison Cutler. She's also fantastic. Um, so we do set, stay close to both regulators as well as um, international uh, governments. You know, UK, Spain, they're doing a lot of things in gaming and, and they're considering NFTs. The U.S. has been very friendly so far, or U.S. Canada, I should say, friendly towards NFTs. Um, obviously, a lot of concern around assets that have sh um, royalties built in or, or sort of profit sharing and, and you know, from a securities perspective. But almost everything else seems to fall cleanly into, um, into sort of, you know, hey, it's a trading card. Hey, it's a commodity, that, 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 that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think there hasn't been enough widespread sort of scams and hacks and things where consumer protection is going to get you know, most of the people that get scammed and hacked are people like us, sort of technologists that just make silly mistakes. Um, and and you know it, it happens it happens way more often than people admit. Um, and so and so um, I'm saying on behalf of a friend. Um, and so the um, and so that that's sort of the uh, I guess at least what I see as as um, uh, from from my seat, which is there's folks that uh, countries in, that in particular that have specific focus on gaming that are looking at nfts and we want to make sure our voice is heard and so we have active you know efforts and speaking with lawmakers and others trying to explain to them hey look in a game environment that digital asset not transparent not tradable not here there are certain rules that like the game maker even is is um in a sense not in control of and so it's better for the customer in almost every way um and that's just a conversation we need to have uh, sometimes one on one so when you think about um, when you're talking to partners for, let's say, music NFTs, where the securities laws may be, you know, kind of harder to determine, how are you navigating that? Um, a good question. We don't do anything directly in music as Dapper Labs. Um, so we have a number of kind of expert um, contacts in our network. And, you know, we're, we're, good, we're close with Jason um, uh, Justin Blau at at, um, uh, at Royal, and we look at their work. We've got a number of music platforms on Flow, like Record Shop and um, and, and others. Uh, we have folks like Steve Stout as as early backers. So we're we're not the music experts. We tend to put folks in touch with with others. Um, they're they're on the long tail. There's a lot of willingness to experiment. Um, on the high end, not a lot of willingness to kind of 
go into the gray area. We understand that. But I think in terms of the high end, the world's top community owners, there's so much, there are many ways they can engage their community that doesn't involve um, direct kind of revenue sharing and profit sharing. And, and that, that's what we tend to focus on is kind of net More of the experience NFTs. Experience NFTs, new kinds of engagement, um, types of engagement that's not currently monetized. I mean, you know, like going backstage, even when the artist isn't there and, and sort of being able to experience a, a piece of the show and, and kind of creating a, you know, a, 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 a meta game around being a Lady Gaga fan, being a Chainsmokers fan, whatever it might be, um, and, and rewarding their top fans with other things in the future, potentially experiential, potentially physical, potentially digital. Um, but doesn't have to be dollars. And in fact, maybe doesn't, maybe shouldn't be. So in the short term, I imagine there's going to be some, you know, kind of regulation around stable coins and, you know, kind of protecting the economy, you know, to the extent that it's at risk for, you know, kind of around the DeFi infrastructure. Um, and less around the you know kind of what what an nft can be can't be since that gets into like really edge use cases that are pretty small and so you imagine you know kind of playing it up the middle in a sense like being relatively conservative in terms of how expansive the nft you know kind of that you kind of involve yourself is going to be um, as Dapper Labs, yes, but but because of the permission nature, permissionless nature of flow, anyone will be able to do anything. We can see what works. Um, you know, things like Audius are pretty interesting on on other platforms, and and they're you know looking for um, new homes given the downtime issues and, and reliability of um, of Solana. So, you know, um, there's 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 all kinds of opportunity for flow as a platform, um, and and we as Dapper Labs, we're going to watch and watch and see. You know, I, it, personally, I believe that you know experimentation is good, um, and and it leads to new um, new customer value, and so regulation shouldn't inhibit it. But as a company, we we always want to be on the right side of um, right side of the law. And do you think that's going to slow things down? One of the questions is like, when will we see titles for homes being on NFTs? So titles for homes was actually one of the first drivers of, of the NFT standard. Um, and, and obviously, as you might imagine, it's an incredibly complex and, and, and globally complex thing. So, so, um, I don't know my, my, I think if you track the, the sort of history of the internet, it took a while until, until people were, it, it took until, you know, until almost everyone had access until things like real utilities became hey, people started relying on, on the internet for, for real utilities. And so. Um, and sort of life and death stuff. Um, and, and in a sense, I think that, you know, um, real estate in particular, given the regulatory environment, et cetera, might not be the, one of the first things to be fully tokenized. Um, but I think almost everything else, there's, there's going to be so many things that are, I, I said this recently at, a, at one of these conferences, which was just like every piece of information that mattered to everyone else, anyone else is online. Um, I think every piece of every asset and piece of value that matter that could matter to anyone else will be on chain, um, and it'll just have access to global markets, global derivatives, global. Um, uh, it'll, it'll be part of everybody's sort of portfolio. But that'll take quite quite some time. I guess my last question, and there are a lot of Googlers who are kind of contemplating, you know, kind of how to think about whether to jump in now. What's your advice to people? Yeah, jump in now. I mean, there's, um, I'm sure there's opportunities within Google to, to get engaged. But like I said, there's so, so much open source opportunity. There's so many um, uh, companies working on interesting projects, including Dapper Labs. You know, and companies in Web3, including Dapper Labs, are also growing and, and, and hiring aggressively. Um, now, now, I think that the, the biggest thing I'd love to see is anyone who's involved with creators to, to just ask them about, hey, look, you know, what ways would you like to engage with your community? And creators include game developers. Um, and there's so many that, hey, oh, no, I wouldn't do crypto, but I really want tradable digital assets. And it's like, well, great. Uh, that's something that, that is totally possible or, or more efficient payments or larger payments or whatever whatever it might be. Um, so it's just incredible opportunities. So I would encourage folks to think of it as a technology, not necessarily 
as um you know in like the silos that already exist today like the speculative marketplaces and, and whatever it might be thank you so much roham this has been such a pleasure it's really just a privilege to have the opportunity to talk to you absolutely thank you david a lot of fun